learn today is the spinal cord injury levels. I've had many requests. Uh, just within the last 24 hours, I had two requests for this content area, Jessica, you being one of them. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Today, I'm not going to go over all the levels, just C1 through C8, but really the intent behind me doing this video is to demonstrate how I went about approaching this content area, how I tackled it, so that you guys can do the rest on your own. Now, I'm going to give you guys a very black and white textbook knowledge uh, for your learning. But to understand that in the clinical situation, the functional outcomes as well as the prognosis may vary uh, depending on many different factors. So um, although it's black and white today, just know that in the back of your mind that when you're working in the uh, real world, it may not always look like this in its perfect quadrants. Okay, because we're all different and we have to provide individualized uh, client centered care. Okay, enough with the intro. I am going to get started, and this is going to be a quite lengthy video, I presume, because there's a lot to go over. But I try my best to make it fun for you guys, and the whiteboard came back. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of tea or whiskey if you prefer, um, and enjoy. Let's get started. Okay, uh, now before I go over each level here, I wanna briefly talk to you guys about the function of the spinal cord. Now if I were to describe a human characteristic or role to a spinal cord, I'd probably give her the title Executive Director of Communication. <laughs> and that's because the spinal cord is essentially in charge of relaying messages. So it's kind of like a conduit between the brain and the rest of our body relaying messages. So when there's an injury to the spinal cord, the functions below that level of injury will suffer for impairment and these impairments include motor and sensory impairments um, it could also be bowel and bladder dysfunction and even respiratory difficulties and the letters and numbers you see here uh, they refer to where in the body the spinal cord injury occurred and the higher the point of injury the greater the impairment okay all right, so let's get started, beginning with the highest point of injury, C1 through C3. Uh, the caption here is, ventilator please, and don't forget your generator. And you can see here that I have an image of Superman, who, as many of you know, uh, was played by the actor Christopher Reeve. And if you recall, he had a terrible horse riding accident that resulted in a complete spinal cord injury above C3. Now, with this kind of high cervical level injury, um, a ventilator is a must. It's required to breathe, one by the bedside and another one that's portable. So uh, when thinking about safety, um, what comes to mind? A generator, right? Or a backup battery. Uh, this is really important, guys, because if you're ventilator dependent, you'll need to have a backup generator. And that's why the caption here reads, ventilator, please, and don't forget your generator. Uh, now let's move down here and look at the movements possible. Uh, with an injury at C1 through C3, you only have head and neck movement, specifically neck flexion, extension, and rotation with paralysis below that region. So what does that tell you about their ability to perform ADLs? essentially none. Uh, patients at these levels will require total assistance around the clock for all aspects of care, uh, including respiratory, bladder and bowel management, and ADLs. So in terms of bed mobility and safety, we are looking at a full electric hospital bed with trendelander feature and side rails. In terms of getting them to transfer to and from bed and wheelchair, uh, remember that they will require total assistance. Uh, so in this case, a power or mechanical lift would come in handy, right? 
I mean, if your movement is limited to just head and neck, think of how that would impact your mobility. So when considering a wheelchair for C1 through C3, uh, we're thinking a power wheelchair with a tilt and a recline function that can be controlled by the chin or head or breath control. And be sure to really understand uh, the importance of the tilt and recline function because pressure relief is critical with sensory loss and with a spinal cord injury, the patient just may not feel that pressure or shearing from uh, extended sitting or lying, and this can lead to skin breakdown or pressure sores, uh, particularly in those vulnerable areas like the bony prominence. So remember that pressure relief should be performed at 30 minute intervals uh, to protect our patients from moisture or heat or shearing. And um, speaking of pressure relief, another important thing we can consider here would be pressure relief mattress. And this is an important consideration, not just for C1 through C3, but for every level of spinal cord injury. Now I know I just talked a lot about pressure relief and it probably won't be the last time in this video because uh, determining a way to relieve pressure to prevent skin breakdown is maybe one of the highest and the most important priorities for our patients with spinal cord injury, particularly during an active phase of rehabilitation. Finally, uh, let's talk about communications. Um, in addition to having a generator and backup battery at C1 through C3, another key important consideration is to ensure access to environmental control unit and high-tech computer access. Um, even though there is no function in the upper extremities, sophisticated electronic communication devices exist, which is really important if your communication is limited due to inability to talk, right? So assistive technologies like computer for speech or typing with mouse stick or voice activation uh, will be important to communicate with caregivers and family and friends. So don't underestimate the utility of mouth electric page turner, um, what else, head pointer, or even voice activation because these technologies uh, will allow our patients to play, I don't know, computer games, access the internet, and even use email. So meaningful occupational engagement is possible at every level and it really is our job to create these opportunities for meaningful participation. All right, so let's move on to C4. Now the caption here reads, catch a breath at C4, cause you got the diaphragm now. So yes, at this level, the patient will have inspiration thanks to the innervation to the diaphragm. And that's a big deal, you guys, because that means you're no longer ventilator dependent. However, in terms of movement possible, patients at C4 still don't have much movement. Uh, the only functional movement we've added here from level C1 through C3 is shoulder elevation. So when thinking about the type of hospital bed required, as well as the level of assistance required for ADLs and transfers, it's pretty much the same as level C1 through C3, uh, which means 24 hours around the clock care. Okay, moving on up to C5. The caption here reads, universal cuffs please, cause I've got no wrist or hand movements. Now, I don't have that iconic image of Winnie the Pooh eating honey out of the jar, but this picture is pretty close to what I want to demonstrate for level C5. So we'll use this image and call him Vinny the Pooh instead. <laughs> now take a good look at Vinny the Pooh here because we're gonna use him for a little bit of storytelling. He is at level C5. Now notice how his arm is bent in flexion. Okay, sear this image into your brain because this is the key functional outcome for C5, the ability to bend or flex the elbows thanks to innervation to the biceps. 
Now, you may not think that this is a big deal, but because of the ability to bend the elbow, uh, Vinnie the Pooh SC5 can begin to participate in some of his ADLs using adaptive devices. Uh, so for example, at this level, patients can eat independently with adaptive devices once the meal is set up, and they can also participate in grooming and upper body dressing with some assistance and adaptive devices. Even so, C5 still requires a lot of assistance, particularly with transfers and bathing. Anyway, let's turn back our attention to Vinnie the Pooh again, who despite his C5 spinal cord injury decided to venture out in search of some honey. But notice here, he's dipping his entire hand into the jar and is eating off of his hand. Uh, and this is not because he has poor table manners, it's because at C5 he still doesn't have any finger or wrist movement to use the utensils. So this is what we're going to do for Vinnie the Pooh. We're going to give him a wrist support to stabilize his wrist, something like a wrist cock up splint. And we're also going to get him some universal cuff that can hold his eating utensils to compensate for his limited grasp. And, oh, let's be sure to also get him some long opponent splint uh, for him to hold his pen or paintbrush or typing stick or whatever he needs in case he wants to write, paint, or use the keyboard after his indulgence with honey. What else do you think Vinnie the Pooh might need at C5? If you said mobile arm support, you are correct. Uh, these mobile arm supports will come in handy at C5 for Vinnie the Pooh, uh, who will need to support the weight of his arms and improve its position for activities. And thanks to all these creative opportunities made possible through the wonderful profession of occupational therapy, Vinnie the Pooh was able to have a full day of fun doing things that are important important and meaningful to him. And now it's time to get him home. So what kind of wheelchair do you think he'll need a C5 injury to get home? A power wheelchair with arm drive control. Did you guys catch that? Uh, I just said arm drive control. That's a big difference, you guys, from C1 through C4, because if you recall, from C1 through C4, patients were using a power wheelchair that is controlled with the head, uh, chin, or breath, remember? But with the biceps and the ability to bend the elbows at C5, we are now using a power wheelchair with arm drive control. Um, another option for Vinnie the Pooh SC5 might be to drive his own vehicle. Oh, you heard that right. This is how advanced our technology is. At C5, driving just may be possible with highly specialized equipment and technology modification. But um, I don't know that Vinnie the Pooh will choose that option because he'll need to go through extensive evaluation and training um, in order to drive and it just might not be worth his time and effort. All right, what about mobility indoors once he gets home? Uh, because Vinny the Pooh is at level C5 with biceps, he can actually switch to a manual lightweight rigid or a folding frame with hammer modifications once he's in the house, as long as uh, it's on level surface and is non-carpeted. And when using a wheelchair, always remember to provide pressure relief cushion, uh, which will allow for independent pressure relief at this level. Okay, so now Vinnie the Pooh is back home after a long day and is going to need a bath. Uh, at this level, he'll still require total assistance for bathing using a padded tub transfer bench or a shower or commode chair. Uh, now, note what I just said, padded, okay? And that's because being wet on a hard surface can put you at risk of developing a pressure sore. So when considering a tub transfer bench, uh, be sure to use one that's padded. All right, now, once we get Vinnie the Pooh all cleaned up, we'll need to get the bed ready. And for uh, C5, it'll still be the same as level C1 through C4. And that is a 
full electric hospital bed with Trendelenburg feature and side rails, still requiring total assistance for transfers to get to and from the bed and wheelchair. So a power um, or mechanical lift would still be useful here. All right, and that wraps up C5. And now we're at C6, where the caption reads, hold and take a bite with a tenodesis grasp. This is a big one because here you have wrist extension. So not only do you have the ability to bend the elbows, now you can also extend your wrist. So take a look here at Snow White lookalike for a visual. We'll pretend it's Snow White's sister and name her Snow Grass. That is grasp with a G-R-A-S-P and you'll see why soon. Uh, do you see how her wrist is extended back while holding this apple? She has functional grasp here with wrist extension. Now listen carefully because this is important. At C6, a major intervention goal is to enhance the development of a tenodesis grasp so that you can promote a strong tripod pinch with those wrist extension. In other words, you're trying to promote a functional grasp. And in case you don't know what tenodesis is, here's a quick review. A tenodesis is basically uh, just the natural tendency of the fingers to curl or flex when the wrist is extended. And that happens because our finger flexor muscles are actually in our forearm and bending the wrist back shortens these tendons making these finger fingers curl so try this with me right now um, i want you to extend your wrist back and observe what happens to your fingers naturally they will curl right extend it back you'll see those fingers curl and now bring your wrist back to flexion and naturally your fingers will extend that my friends is tenodesis now remember how I said earlier that a major intervention goal for C6 is to enhance the development of a tenodesis grasp? Here's how you do it. You can have a caregiver passively provide range of motion by ranging the finger flexors with the wrist fully extended and the finger extensors when the wrist is flexed. Basically, we want to really strengthen the wrist extensors to maximize natural tenodesis action. Uh, this will help develop a tenodesis grasp, and this grasp, along with the radial wrist extension that's possible at C6, will allow the patient to stabilize their hands for compensatory grasp activities like mm, picking up the bottle or sliding an object, or in the case of Snow White, uh, pick up that apple for that one last fatal bite. Okay? Oh, and here's one thing to note here about the tenodesis grasp. Although the patient may be able to perform a slight grip through extending the wrist, uh, they would not be able to sustain this grip for functional activity due to limited hand and finger strength. So we would need a tenodesis splint, which is also known as uh, the wrist-driven flexor hinge tenodesis splint at C6. Okay, now let's talk about bed mobility and transfers. Um, in terms of the type of bed required, patients at level C6 can use either a full electric hospital bed or they may be able to use a full to king standard bed. Okay, and as long as the surface is even for transfers, they'll be able to transfer independently using a transfer board. And this is a key difference from level C5 to C6. If you recall, every level from C1 through C5 required a full electric hospital bed with Trendelenburg feature and side rails. Remember that? And they also require total assistance for transfers. But at C6, you just may be able to use a standard under bed and even transfer independently on even surface with a transfer board. And to remember this, I like to think of Snow White's story and draw parallels. So in the same way that Snow White makes a transition from her fancy palace and bed to a standard bed in a cottage, 
I like to think of patients as C6 making a transition from a fancy, high-tech, electronic bed with all the bells and whistles of a Trendelenburg feature and side rails to a modest standard bed at home. And by the time you're using a standard bed, transfer to and from the bed and wheelchair become that much more manageable with a transfer board. Oh, and here's another parallel you can make with Snow White's story. At C6, patients can groom somewhat independently using adaptive devices, and you need to look no further than Snow White's impeccable hair and glamorous makeup to help you remember that patients at this level are capable of grooming and dressing themselves uh, using adaptive devices. So let's talk about what some of these devices are and how patients, with the help of occupational therapy, uh, might achieve Snow White's glamour even at level C6 spinal cord injury. Uh, first, for that royal princess gown, we can provide a front opening dress and attach loops to zipper pulls to make it easy to pull up the zipper of the dress. And how about for a blouse for days that you don't want to wear a dress and you have to button? Well, button hook would be great to compensate for poor finger dexterity, uh, but that might not be enough because you still have pretty weak grasp at C6 and you may not be able to hold onto that button hook for a sustained period of time to actually button everything. So uh, we might actually provide a palmer cuff button hook for a sustained activity. Um, and what about, oh, undergarments? We'll need a bra so we can get some front open bras and adapt it by adding velcro closure for easy opening and as for underwear in the case of patients with a spinal cord injury it's actually uh, more cumbersome than not because underwear can potentially lead to skin breakdown and make it that much more difficult to use the restroom so we can probably ditch the underwear and finally shoes uh, we can adapt it by adding velcro or large buckles or even elastic shoelaces. I mean, it's really not the cutest option, but it's functional and practical and it'll help to enhance independence. So this is the kind of knowledge application, clinical application, uh, that we need to be doing at each level instead of frantically trying to memorize every single thing here, which um, admittedly I've been guilty of. <laughs> it's really important, I think, to understand the functional outcome that is possible with every level and how that might facilitate or help with participation in occupations. So um, think about the muscles innervated and the possible movements that come with those innervated muscles and apply this knowledge to what you might need to provide the patient uh, to make them as independent as possible. Mm, let me give you another example. Bathing, same concept. Uh, what would be some adaptive tools you can give to patients who at C6 might have limited hand function and weak grasp? Built-up handles? Yes, or you can just eliminate the need to grasp altogether by using bath mitts or bath gloves. And for hard to reach areas, uh, you can give long handled bath brushes with soap insert. <laughs> See how that works? At C6, there's a greater level of independence with adaptive devices because you have wrist extension. And with that comes tenodesis grasp. But because patients still don't have great hand and finger strength and dexterity here at this point, uh, these adaptive devices play a critical role in promoting independence for ADLs. All right? Oh, and I almost forgot one more important thing at C6. Um, at this level, patients can do their own skin inspection using a long handle mirror. Uh, and they can also turn in bed to perform pressure release independently at C6, which will help um, in preventing skin breakdown. So a lot of good things happening here at C6. Finally, let's talk about wheelchair mobility. So at level C6, patients can use a power wheelchair with a standard arm drive control or a manual lightweight rigid or folding frame with modified rims. So if you remember, that's essentially the same as level C5, right? So at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, with all these wheelchair options available for both C5 and C6, 
how am I going to choose the right one and what factors do I have to consider? Well, we certainly have to consider the functional outcome possible and what the patients are able to do, but this is just the beginning, you guys. Uh, we have to go beyond that and think about the patient's needs um, in the context of what they actually want to do, as well as the environment that the wheelchair will be used in. So if we take it back to level C5, um, very briefly as a reminder, and think about Winnie the Pooh, who loves honey, loves being outdoors, and expresses his desire to venture out daily in search of honey, um, what do you think would be the best wheelchair for him out in the community? We'd give him a power wheelchair with a standard arm drive, right? Um, and bringing it back to Snow White here at level C6, well, although she may be able to use a manual rigid wheelchair on the smooth surface of her palace floors and doors, it would be way too cumbersome and taxing for her to have to use a manual wheelchair outdoors. Um, she would not be able to get very far at all. So in both cases, for Winnie the Pooh or Snow White, a better option for community mobility outdoors would be a power wheelchair with arm drive control. And I promise this is the last thing I'll mention before moving on to C7, but this is so important and I didn't want to forget. Uh, what is one thing that you might do for Snow White before she returns back to her palace after living in the forest all these years? A home evaluation. Or in this case, you might call it a palace evaluation. <laughs> you guys get the point. Um, this is important, you guys, to make sure that Snow White can return home and actually do the stuff she needs to do as much as possible and as safely as she can. So we are thinking safety and accessibility. Okay, so once the discharge location is determined, a home evaluation is an important step. Okay. That was a lot. Finally, moving on to C7. Oh, this is my favorite one. Not because seven is my lucky number, but because I get to talk about Ariel here. <laughs> She's my favorite Disney character, and I think I have the entire movie memorized verbatim. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look here at Ariel. The caption is, Push up and lift, because you got the triceps now. That's right. At C7, the main functional outcome is elbow extension and full strength of all shoulder thanks to innervation of the triceps. So to visualize this, think back to the scene in the movie when Ariel is sitting on a rock singing part of your world. Do you guys remember that epic moment on the rock when she powerfully extend her arms to push up against the rock with waves crashing all around? That, I think, is one of my favorite scenes. Well, here I have my own version of that song, and hopefully it'll help you remember C7. <laughs> Entertain me. When's it my turn? When I love? Love to extend these arms and push out, out of my seat. Wish I could be C7 now. <laughs> oh boy. All right, moving on. <laughs> At this level, at C7, the patient is independent with eating, grooming, dressing, bathing, and transfers with adaptive devices and equipment. And although you're relying on adaptive equipment to compensate for limited grasp, uh, you're not using these devices nearly as much as you did at C5 or even C6 because you now have full strength of all shoulder and elbow extension here. So to remember this, uh, let's think back again to Ariel and her quest to be independent out of the sea. Uh, she had to learn to adapt with human tools, remember? Even brushing her hair with a fork. Uh, but she pretty much went on to being independent and using these tools and adaptive devices to help her along the way. So as C7, uh, remember you have elbow extension with full strength of the arms, relying minimally on adaptive equipment for eating, 
grooming, dressing, or bathing. Oh, and one more very important thing to note, um, a C7 uh, is the ability to do depression transfer. Uh, don't forget this one, guys. It's an important functional outcome at C7. Oh, wow, we made it, guys. Who are on C8? Yes, I'm tired too. <laughs> Oh, almost there. So the caption for this one is eighth grade graduation. So C8, eighth grade. Because when I graduated from middle school in eighth grade and started high school, I felt like I was on top of the world, capable of doing anything I wanted. Well, from level C8, patients are pretty much independent in all aspects of self-care because they have enough fine motor control with finger and thumb flexion, extension, and abduction. And uh, they can also participate in most leisure activities uh, because they have good functional use of both upper extremities. Uh, they have the triceps and shoulder depressors to complete transfers independently from bed to wheelchair without any assisted equipment with just standby assist. So very independent SCA. But the most important functional outcome to remember here is that you've got greater hand function, which allows for greater independence. And that concludes our review of functional outcome C1 through C8. But wait, don't go anywhere because we're not quite done yet. I want to talk to you guys about two things to watch out for with spinal cord injuries. Um, now, take a look at a photo of this woman here. Her face is flushed and you can see the beads of sweat on her face. Uh, what she may be experiencing here is autonomic dysreflexia, um, also known as autonomic hyperreflexia. This is a medical emergency and life-threatening condition caused by a reflex action in the autonomic nervous system. This is an acute uncontrolled hypertension, meaning dangerously high blood pressure, which presents with a pounding headache, nausea, sweating, uh, flushed face, and bradycardia, which means that the heartbeat slows down. And if this occurs, we need to immediately place our client in an upright position, remove anything restrictive, and check the catheter for an obstruction. And that's because uh, this is often triggered by a strong, painful, or noxious input. And a common causes include bladder and bowel distension, um, as well as irritation to the skin or anything that's really just strong or painful. And once the inciting noxious stimulus is removed, uh, this hypertension will usually resolve itself. So finding out the source of this trigger is important. Okay, now remember this can occur for anyone with injuries above T6. So be sure to watch out for this with any patient with a spinal cord injury C1 through T6. Okay, secondly, watch out for orthostatic hypotension. This is the opposite of autonomic dysreflexia. This is where there is a drop. In blood pressure. It is common with cervical levels and high thoracic spinal cord injuries. And it is also most common right after the injury and in the few weeks of uh, rehabilitation. And one of the more common signs you'll see is uh, lightheadedness or dizziness. When you see this in a patient, uh, you would want to immediately recline that patient and raise the legs to elevate the blood pressure. Uh, so let's review these two conditions in terms of what happens to your blood pressure. With autonomic dysreflexia, you get increased blood pressure and you sit the patient upright. With orthostatic hypotension, your blood pressure decreases and you recline the patient. So an easy way to remember would be to know that when the blood pressure goes up, posture goes up because you sit them upright and when the blood pressure goes down posture goes down because you put them in recline and raise the legs so let's see how long it's been oh my goodness 33 minutes i cannot believe it i think this is the longest video i've done yet I don't know if you guys are still here. You probably turned it off and got snacks or something halfway through. But um, 
I hope this was helpful for you guys. Um, I enjoyed creating this for you, but um, I would also encourage you uh, to come up with your own stories, your own examples, and learn them um, with your own life stories and experiences because that'll really help you to learn and retain the information, okay? All right, you guys, um, have a wonderful rest of the day and be sure to incorporate study breaks and remember what Winnie the Pooh said, okay? You are smarter than you think. Okay, bye.